Thank you, uh, Jean, uh, for the warm introduction. And thank you all for inviting me to be with you today. It's great to be here. Uh, what I'd like to do is have a conversation with you about what you're experiencing here in Minnesota, what you're seeing in your local economy, what's happening in your communities, so I can learn from you. I'm happy to share with you my thoughts, but I'm, maybe even more importantly, I'm here to learn from you and hear directly from you. Uh, so I'll, I'll speak for just a few minutes just to talk about the Fed. Some of you may know this, many of you may not. I didn't know much about the Fed before I went to Washington, D.C. I always find it's helpful to level set. And then we can have a conversation, and, and I'll turn it back over to, to Gene to kick it off, and then we'll open it up to hear from all of you as well. Let me start by explaining why there is such a thing as the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Why are we here? Why am I here? Well, if you look at our nation's history, our country always hated the idea of having a central bank. Alexander Hamilton created the first central bank in the United States. It was very controversial. Our country hated it because it sounded mysterious. A bunch of bankers in a dark room doing God knows what. It all sounded very undemocratic. So it lasted a few decades, and then they finally got rid of it, said, finally, we can get rid of this thing. And then in the 1800s, the late 1800s, our economy kept getting hammered with financial crises, culminating in a huge one, the banking panic of 1907. And then Congress said, well, we hate the idea of having a central bank, but I guess we need one to manage these ups and downs. So let's create a central bank, but instead of having all the power concentrated in Washington, D.C. or in New York, let's distribute it out around the country so that it's not so concentrated. And that's what they did. They came up in 1913. Congress created the Federal Reserve System, which includes the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. I'm sure you've heard of our chair, Janet Yellen. Before her was Ben Bernanke. Before him was Alan Greenspan. Those board members, there's up to seven of them, are appointed by the president, president of the United States, and they're confirmed by the US Senate. And then they said, let's distribute the rest of the power out around the country. And they created 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks, including the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And our jobs at the Minneapolis Fed are to represent you. Our jobs are to know what is happening in our local economy, in our region, which includes Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, part of Michigan, part of Wisconsin, so that when I go back to Washington, D.C. eight times a year and we set interest rates for the country, I'm able to speak very seriously about what you are telling me is happening in our local economy. And so the separation of powers is literally designed into the structure of the Federal Reserve System that Congress created 100 years ago. And the structure is not perfect, but it's actually worked pretty well over those 100 years bringing a variety of perspectives to economic policy making. And so it's very important for me, a big part of my job is getting out around the region and Dorothy Bridges, our senior vice president, really helps me with this to get to know what's happening in the local communities and bring this information back. So that's why there's a Minneapolis Fed. And this is, by the way, this is different in our country than virtually all other countries. In most other countries, the central bank is in the nation's capital. That's where the power is, that's where the knowledge is. This is something that makes our central bank different, and I think it's a real strength for us. Now, one of our huge priorities, monetary policy we can talk about if you're interested, is obviously a big priority. You talked about bank regulation. Another big priority for us is economic research. How is the economy doing? What are the structural factors that can lead to better economic outcomes for our communities? Now, Congress has given us what we call our dual mandate. You may hear about this if you read about the Fed in the paper. The dual mandate that Congress has given us is number one, stable prices. And that means an economy that's not overheating and an economy that's not growing too slowly. Think about even economic growth. And then number two, maximum employment. That means as many Americans who want to work are able to get a job. By the way, that is something else that is different about our central bank than most other central banks in the world. Most other central banks just have an inflation mandate that's stable prices. Our central bank also has maximum employment. That's really, really important because sometimes inflation and, and the job market are in tension with one another. Sometimes they're working together. And understanding both of these dynamics, I think, is very important to us. And it's a big part of the research that we're doing. 
So one thing I want to talk about, and I'd love to have a conversation and hear from you, we announced a major new research initiative at the Minneapolis Fed focused on what, we're taught, what we call inclusive growth and economic opportunity. How do we analyze what are the barriers to everybody who wants to participate in a strong economy being able to get that good job, being able to have real economic opportunity, participate in the workforce? And this is something that we don't know nearly as much about as we should. And we want to try to close that knowledge gap. And we're going to do our part at the Minneapolis Fed. So this is a major new research initiative. And where this came from is, with Dorothy's help, my getting out around the district, around the region, learning about what's going well and what the challenges are. And you know, Minnesota has a lot of strengths going for us. Overall, we have a highly educated workforce. Overall, we have diverse uh, industries represented here. Overall, on average, we have good schools compared to most states. But if you look under the cover, we have massive disparities that I was surprised to learn about. And I started asking very basic questions. Why do we have these disparities? We don't know. I was surprised how few answers we have underlying these disparities. So there are racial disparities. There are rural and urban disparities. There are multiple elements to this. And I was surprised how little we understood about those factors driving those disparities. And a data point that I'll share with you, and then I'll stop talking and, and turn it back to Gene, that I found so shocking was that in America, African-American unemployment is always twice white unemployment. In a booming economy, it's twice. In a recession, it's twice. And even if you compare college graduate against college graduate, it's twice. If you compare high school dropout against high school dropout, it's twice. It's remarkable. I mean, it's shocking. And it's remarkable how consistent it is. And so I started asking researchers at the Fed and around, at the Minneapolis Fed and around the country, why is that? Why is it always 2x? I got blank stares back. And so I said, you know what? If we hope to develop policy solutions, we need to first understand the why. And so that's an example of the type of research we hope to do to try to analyze the root causes. We don't necessarily think that monetary policy can address these gaps. Because monetary policy, we have one interest rate we have to set for the whole country. We can't set it, target it at individual states or individual communities. But if we can bring our research expertise to bear to analyze these questions, then I feel like we have a contribution we can make. And the sorry, I said that was the last thing. The last thing I'll tell you <laughs> before I turn it over to you is an example of this work that the Minneapolis Fed has done that we're very proud of long predates me. Our bank did very important work on early childhood education, which many of you are probably familiar with, where we can't directly affect education policy. Right? That's not within our mandate. But our bank felt like if we can bring objective, non-political analysis to it, then we can arm other policymakers with that information, and then perhaps they can take it forward. And I think many policymakers in the state of Minnesota have picked up that information and have taken it forward. We're not done yet, but I think the state of Minnesota is far ahead of most of the rest of the country in getting behind early childhood education. And the Minneapolis Fed's role was to bring the analysis to say, this is a good return on taxpayer dollars. So if we can come up with other examples like that that help close these gaps, then I feel like that's an important contribution for us to make, and we're going to do that. But it's going to, be, it's going to take time. Right? These problems are very long in the making. There's, I doubt there's an easy answer uh, on the shelf, but we're going to do our part. So with that, sorry for the long-winded wind-up. We'd love to hear, you know, Gene, what questions do you have, and then we can hear from everybody else. So thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. So as Neil said, we want to make this very con conversational with all of you, and we really are pleased with the attendance. I think this is the largest summer attendance we've had, by the way. That's so great. It's a, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, wonderful to have you here. Um, I, I'll kick it off with a question, but again, we really welcome, and we've got people um, uh, in the audience, Marianne and Adrian, that have mics. So if, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand to let us know. 
So as you talk about this initiative, one, one thing that always strikes me is this economic inequality isn't something new, that you know, this has been something we've recognized in this community for a long time. So I'm wondering if you have any insight or visibility or maybe some assumptions as to some key factors. And I, I, what, I, what I wonder as an organization, a committed organization to a community, to make impact in communities, and I know many other uh, corporate uh, citizens feel the same, how can, how can we help achieve the mission that you're setting out? How can we be a part of that process to really gain an understanding and really accelerate the pace of making the change? Yeah, well, um, so one, one factor that I know is, this is not everything, but it's a big factor. I don't need more research to tell me this, is disparities in education. It's a huge factor. And you know, we just did some very quick analysis looking at publicly available data on Minneapolis public schools. And if you, if you create a chart and you line up on one axis the percentage of students that are diverse, and you line up on the other axis how experienced the teachers are, the more diverse the student body, the less experienced the teachers. Right? That's the opposite of what it should be, and that's the way it is. And so that's an example of something that's right there that needs to be addressed. So education is clearly a huge part of it. So on average, Minnesota schools, I think we're roughly seventh, if you look at the data in terms of student achievement. But then if you look beneath the surface, there are huge gaps in racial disparity in particular and economic disparity. So education is clearly a huge part of it. So to the extent, and you're probably already doing this, to the, I mean, I saw so many heads nodding. To the extent that you're getting involved in education, closing those education gaps, that's a key part of it. And then part of it is you grounding us with what you're experiencing every day. So I'll give you an example. We had our first, let me actually back up another second. I started calling the best researchers in the country, the best academics around the country who are doing work in these areas, and said, would you have any interest in partnering with us? Much to my pleasant surprise, 100% of the people I called said yes. So now we have this world-class group of advisors helping us, and we brought many of them to Minneapolis to our bank in May for our kickoff conference. So picture the uh, one our research director calls it a bunch of pointy-headed academics, but it's, these are the pointiest heads of the pointy-headed <laughs> academics, okay? The smartest and sharpest points. But we wanted to ground the mm -hmm. academic discussion, and so who did we invite to speak as our keynote speaker? Sandra Samuels from the Northside Achievement Zone. And Sandra is a I mean, remarkable woman, a remarkable leader, and she told us about the challenges that she's living with every day and the work that they're doing every day. And there are no easy answers and what they're experiencing. So part of what you can do for us is ground our analysis, our research, our academic focus with the reality of what you're experiencing day to day on the ground. Because if we don't connect this back to on the ground results every day, then we're going to just get lost in our own big ideas. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, this is about results. It's about changing lives and changing trajectories on the ground every day, and we need your help to do that. Hi, I'm Sheila Riggs, and in healthcare and at the University of Minnesota, I wondered how healthcare fits into your portfolio, and then thank you for the invitation to give you information. How do we provide you what? You and Dorothy need uh, on health care. It has the same uh, disparities. Um, you know, right, right down the street, HCMC, uh, it takes such a burden of it. How can we get you that information? But, but first, I'd like to understand health care in your portfolio. Well, I think uh, um, there's going to be no shortage of factors that all contribute and magnify or amplify these disparities. And health care clearly, clearly is a huge, huge factor. Um, I, don't, I wish I had more to say and more data. You know much more about it than I do. We're at the earliest stages. All I can tell you is healthcare is part of it. We do hear this a lot about access to healthcare. By the way, it affects education outcomes, right? I mean, it affects all these other things. So does housing. Housing is another big factor. Uh, segregation was a topic that came up alarmingly in, uh, in our discussions. So all of these factors, do contribute and they either reinforce or amplify some of the same, uh, same elements. But with Dorothy's help, we are looking for putting together different roundtables of advisors from the community to bring us this kind of insight. When we come up with ideas, bouncing these ideas off of you to say, hey, our data is suggesting this. Does this make sense 
you know, based on what you're seeing. Or if you're seeing pilot programs that are working, that are, let us, let us know about that. And so, you know, we will reach out to you to let you know different forums to get us that information. You know, we have a 50 state laboratory around the country of people who are trying interesting things. We don't have to invent everything new from scratch. Let's go figure out what's working around Minnesota or around the country. Let's analyze it dispassionately and let's bring those ideas forward. And I feel like that's a, probably the fastest way we can make progress. But that connection to you and uh, your colleagues is gonna be very important. Thank you. Welcome, Neil. And, and thank you, Dorothy Bridges, for bringing the Fed into the community in, in ever uh, more relevant ways. I had noticed about you, and I don't know you very well, that you are not a seat warmer. You're, you know, you arrived, and, and even before you arrived, we got a sense that we better get ready because we were gonna be, we were gonna be doing some work and I appreciate that about you. And so you invited observations, and I'm going to share an observation and then ask you for yours. I'm, I'm not from the Midwest. I grew up on the East Coast. And what I, I see here is, is really extraordinary, um, extraordinary in the good and extraordinary in the bad, and in a way, sort of a, 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 a a small example of everything we're working out everywhere around the country. I mean, we have government that's gone to the brink and over the edge with a government shutdown. We had an orchestra that closed its doors for, for so many days in, in a contract issue with, uh, with labor. We have, I mean, this is the community that lost Philando Castile, the community that prosecuted the police officer who shot him and the community that acquitted that police officer. There are so many things here. We have the most Fortune 500 companies in terms of density. We have the biggest inequities. I mean, it's like all getting worked out here in a really, I think, fascinating way. We have a city council that is very progressive and lefty that's about to perhaps get thrown out for an even more progressive and left city council. And so the observation I would ask of you is um, what do you see going on here that is instructive around national issues? And what would you say to us as we are completely dissatisfied with the outcomes that we're getting around pace of change, uh, you know, appropriate actions and responses so that we can engage in productive and constructive ways? Yeah. Well. Um I mean, I obviously I agree with all of your observations. Uh, one of the things, one of the real strengths of this community that I've seen, I've lived all around the country, in many places around the country, as Jean mentioned, uh, this place is way more civically engaged than any other place I've lived at, whether it's the business communities or the nonprofit leaders, uh, and it's genuine. I mean, I think people really do care about the region and their neighbors, and they want to be part of the solutions. So in that sense, it's even more surprising that we have these problems because you'd think if anybody could solve them, it'd be the folks who are here. I'd also observe, by the way, every time I go back to Washington, D.C., so eight times a year, I spend a day and I go up to Capitol Hill visiting with our elected representatives. We have a remarkable delegation of elected representatives here. I'm not talking Republican or Democrat. I'm saying all of them that I've met with are very thoughtful. They're very constructive. They don't hate each other, right? I mean, seriously, this is a... They genuinely respect one another, even if they are on other sides of the aisle. That's not true everywhere. And so I do think many of the strengths that Minnesota has are real and things to be proud of. Now, I don't have an answer for why, with all of that, we haven't been able to tackle some of these big, big problems yet. I do know that the region has changed a lot in the last 20 years in terms of demographics, and the region is trying to catch up to absorbing the more diverse population that the region has now than it had 20 or 30 years ago. And that's taken time and it's not always gone smoothly, I think, to, to put it mildly. I also think there's a, um, you know, this may, not everybody may be happy with this, what I'm about to say, but as a, as a transplant, uh, this community is welcoming to a point, right? <laughs> and so, uh, it's very interesting you think about it. The community welcomes uh, refugees from around the world, but it's also at a little bit of a distance. So we'll welcome refugees, but then we also have very steep segregation that's been increasing over the past 20 years. So I don't know how to change the hearts and minds to say, you know what, let's break down the segregation, and if we're going to welcome people, let's fully welcome people, as opposed to welcoming them 75% of the way there. So I feel like some of these cultural issues are also rooted in the inability to tackle some of these, uh, these underlying challenges. But I don't have better answers for you than that yet. 
Hi, I'm Paula Philippi, and I'm with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. I'm interested as you tackle the research. Um, we have these um, large disparities in outcomes in health, education, income in our state and in our region. And it leads me to question if there is long-term um, structural discrimination, um, institutional poli policies that have led to these uh, differences in outcomes. From a research standpoint, how are you gonna try to connect those root causes to historical and institutional policies and actions that were taken that um, may need some additional effort to overcome? Well, by the way, uh, you're definitely right. Uh, discrimination is clearly part of it. Uh, and I think, and by the way, we heard that loud and clear from some of our advisors who spent their careers analyzing these. And I mean, I think at a very simple level, I know it's more complicated than this, you look for the factors that you can say education, health, segregation, et cetera, et cetera, and then there's a residual. All the things you think you can explain with, then you've got a big residual, and discrimination is a big part of that residual. So I think you're absolutely right, and we're trying to unravel this and disaggregate it. Um, but these are, these are very, very complicated. I'll give you an example. I mentioned college graduate against college graduate, the two to one unemployment gap. That, that statement that I just made implies that everybody gets access to the same quality college, which may not in fact be the case, it, which I know is not in fact the case. And so you have to start digging deeper and digging deeper to try to unravel this and learn as much as you can and try to look at what policies can close these gaps. And so you're right to point that out. I agree with you, it's gonna be a focus. Hi, I'm Carolyn Smallwood. Uh, I'm the CEO of an organization called Way to Grow, and we have utilized Federal Reserve research on early education. Matter of fact, Art Rolnick sat on our board of directors. Oh, that's great. And I had a wonderful opportunity to hear you speak, I think in February at a national conference. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, ditto to everybody that was just speaking. Uh, I was basically th sitting here thinking about I'm going to jump on the young lady's conversation about systematic racism. One of my questions, and uh, perhaps uh, this is just my judgment and theory, not only that we only have to work with the heart and hands of folks here in the audience, but it's going to have to start with us individually when it comes to racial discrimination. Also, what's going to be important is that we look at some policies that have been made throughout the United States that have really uh, set a uh, several generations of human beings behind many, many, many years. Uh, a couple things that come to mind is that creating a level of awareness. A lot of folks are not aware about some of the huge disparities and why they occurred. So uh, with your research, uh, one of the recommendations, and who am I to make a recommendation, Please. is to say that uh, awareness is gonna be a key, key factor in any research. I can give you several examples. One, as far as the, uh, the, uh, the prison system, you know, they collect data on third graders to build our prisons. This is a multi-billion dollar industry here, okay, based on the grade scores, the MCA scores of our young children, okay? So people are not aware of that. We need to bring forth awareness what for example, slavery have done to African Americans throughout the United States. So there was four levels of, uh, as I call, terrorists. We, we, we talk about terrorists all the time. People are not aware that Jim Crow and lynching of over 4,000 people in the United States between 1890 to 1950, that was a lower level of terrorists that affected several generations, not only African Americans, but brown folks, as well as poor whites that were worked in servitude. So I would recommend, highly recommend, that we create a level of awareness for all of us. So thank you. Thank you. you know, I, I'll just say, uh, I think raising awareness on, on these issues is enormously important, and I'll give you an example. It's a different issue, but I'm gonna give you an example. One of the first policy issues we took on after I joined, which the bank had worked on in the past, was the issue of too big to fail banks. So we spent a year 
analyzing it, came up with a plan, uh, and I'm using every opportunity I can to raise awareness that the biggest banks in America are still too big to fail and taxpayers are still on the hook. As an example of that, on Monday, I had another op-ed in the Wall Street Journal talking about this issue to try to raise awareness, to put our citizens and our elected leaders on alert. This issue is still there and there's something you can do about it. We've come up with a plan. So I'm with you. I think that raising awareness on whatever the issue is that we're trying to tackle is enormously important if we want to get action done. In the case of these disparities that we're focused on, economic opportunity, all I'm saying to you is we have a lot more work to do before I'm prepared to get out there and say, I don't want to just get out there and say, here's a problem. I want to get out there and say, here's a problem and here's what the data says are real solutions that we can get behind. Hi, Neil. Hi. I've seen you speak the last few months, uh, and every time I'm inspired and learn something new. So thanks for being here today. My name is Susan Adams Lloyd, and I'm the CEO at the Better Business Bureau of Minnesota and North Dakota. And we work with businesses to make them better, help them be better, and create an ethical marketplace for s consumers and businesses to work together. 80% of our businesses are small businesses, under 10 people, and the vast majority of those businesses are owner operators, people who grew up in the business, maybe they're a roofer or a plumber or a graphic arts company and they've worked their way through their business and now own it and maybe don't have the formal education that um, many of our institutions in this area are, um, um, I, I feel like they're designed to help the workforce but oftentimes the small business owner gets overlooked. They need access to information they need access to capital. They need help and mentoring to get over the hurdles of being a business person. They think of themselves as a tradesperson and they've kind of learned a lot of those skill sets often just by experience. What can we do to help those kinds of businesses be better and help sustain our economy in the very diverse way that you described before? Well, hold on, before you give the microphone up, what can we do, meaning what can you all do or are you asking what can the Fed do? Well, I mean, I think you're probably already doing it. I mean, in your role at the Better Business Bureau and looking at small business administration and what resources they bring. I'm not that, to be honest with you, I'm not that familiar with programs run by the Small Business Administration and whether there are state and local programs, incubators, et cetera, uh, to give people either the capital or the knowledge that they need to be successful small businesses. One thing you can think about, which our research is already doing work on, is the fact that in our country today, we have this over-licensing uh, disease that is getting added and added and added and it's making it much 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 harder for individual entrepreneurs to open their own small businesses to become practitioners I heard a story I think it was in Indiana where they had it cost thousands of dollars to become a hair braider the things that people learn from their moms or their grandmothers they created some licensing scheme and who did it it was professional barbers said we don't want any competition so they came up with more licensing rules to keep out competition. So a lot of these rules, they may market them as they're designed to protect consumers. They're really designed to keep out workers from competing with other small businesses. And so sometimes we have to have a hard look in the mirror and say, what are we doing? Is this really a good new rule that's going to help the community? Or if you layer all these rules on top of each other, do they just make it much, much harder for small businesses to succeed? So, I mean, I think these are enormously complicated issues, but more education, more information uh, is, clearly, is clearly part of the answer. Thank you. Um, Adrian Dirks, Executive Director, Project Success, and this is more of a comment, and then I will take the next question here, is that um, this is an and to what you said, Carolyn, and to what you said, uh, Neil, which is, We've, we've been doing, we've been working with almost every Minneapolis public school student and their families for 25 years, 100,000 kids and families. And as many of you in this room, we've been through many projects around data, around new initiatives. And one of the things that I think is the and is what action are you taking today for our children? Um, and I think that's an important and to the data, and I just, as we were talking about at lunch, today, so I went through a year-long process around a redesign of schools. Hundreds of hours, 
things changed, we didn't do anything with that. But we got to know each other quite well. But, um, <laughs> but it hit me that next morning, I will continue to fight the fight. Right, Danielle? But every day, we are going to increase what we're already doing in opportunities for kids. So we've taken almost 300 kids on global experiences, high level. 100 kids right now are in the boundary waters with the best thing. And this parent who's been, who arrived here two years ago from Ghana, we were taking his son to Paris on this global experience, because damn it, we are going to take action on opportunities. So we're not all just going to Paris, but our kids are going to Paris. And this dad lifted me up at the airport and said, Adrian, this world is a mess. The only thing that's going to solve it is angels like you, with love, and with action. People have hated my son, and you said he's important. And my point of that statement is, yes, Dada, yes, we have to look what we're doing, but we have to take action every day and show kids that we love them and that they are important. So thank you for what you're doing, and we have to do that, because we have had a history of not doing that. So next question on my side. Who's over here? Um, by way of background, my firm manages uh, growth equity funds, and we invest in second stage fast growth businesses, usually technology-enabled um, firms. And um, at our weekly partnership meeting, uh, we were discussing the challenges we've been facing hiring, finding people. And um, uh, one of our partners is a former economist with the Federal Reserve Bank. And he said, you know, I just don't understand the labor participation rate. What mm -hmm. is going on there? And we were kind of theorizing about it um, in our conversation. And I said, look, I'm having lunch with Neil on Tuesday, so I'll just <laughs> ask him. <laughs> so is there any light that you could shed on, on that? Sure. I'll do my best. Um, so uh, tell me your name again. What's your name? My Leslie. name is Leslie Frakon, okay. and my firm is yep. LFE Capital. So Leslie is asking, if you look at the data on what percentage of um, uh, our population are working, it's been declining over the last decade, 20 years or so. And it's mostly declining because uh, our population is aging. So this demographic challenge is predictable. It was known. It's unfolding the way we expect. More people are retiring. We're having fewer kids. The population is aging. So the percentage of the population that is working is declining. So that we know. But even if you look at the working age population, call it 24 to 55, it also has declined from the Great Recession. And we're not exactly sure why. It's been climbing back up a little bit, or, or stable, stable, climbing back up a little bit. There's still more room to go. There are a bunch of factors underneath it that are not fully explainable. One of the real conundrums is men the male labor force participation is also going down. You know, something like 50 years ago, I'm going to get the data exact, it's not exactly right, something like 50 years ago, 95% plus of working age men worked. It's now a lot less than that. Now, one of the good things is that women are now working, and so that's a huge change versus 50 years ago. Women are in the workforce, so that really helped our economy. And it seems as though as more women entered the workforce, Maybe fewer men then needed to work, and so that kind of shifted a little bit. But there's a bunch of other stuff going on that we don't have great explanations for. One theory that's been getting a lot of buzz in economic circles lately, believe it or not, is that as video games have gotten better, more young men have said, you know what, I like playing video games, and they have chosen not to work, or not to work as many hours as a result of video games. It's somewhat controversial, <laughs> but there's some data supporting it. But it's, but it's somewhat far-fetched. I mean, the, the far, it doesn't explain the fact, you know, Japan has a lot of video games too, and they're not seeing the same trends that we're seeing here. So maybe it's also. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, another, another avenue is people may be staying in school longer, and that's why there's fewer people, fewer young people in the workforce than you would otherwise we don't have good answers for this, is the honest answer. And another thing we don't have good answers for, 
a really important question that we're wrestling with right now. The, whole, the overall headline unemployment rate has come down a lot. So nationally, it's 4.4%, but wage growth is still really low. You would normally expect, as the unemployment rate gets lower, businesses would be competing for workers, and that would drive up wages, which would then drive up inflation. Somehow that process is broken right now. So unemployment is low, but wage growth is also low. So when I go around the district, I hear from businesses all the time that say, we can't find workers. First of all, they say, we can't find skilled workers. And then I say, why don't you train them? And then they say, or no, first I say, why don't you pay more? And then they say, well, I can't pay more. So then I say, well, you're just complaining. Right? You're not serious. If you really wanted to find workers, pay more, and I bet you'll find workers. And then they say, well, we can't find skilled workers. I say, why don't you train them? And then many businesses tell me, we can't find workers that are trainable. We can't find workers that will show up at 8 o'clock every day. We can't find workers that will work 40 hours a week. Let me give you an example. I went to Wisconsin recently on an outreach tour to our district. You remember the November election? The national narrative from the November election was Wisconsin, was all these manufacturing jobs have been lost, and you had all these men who could not find work today. I went up to Wisconsin, and I met a lot of small business owners, and they said, we can't find workers. And I said, wait a second, what about all these men that have been laid off from factories? And they said, that's not true. They said, we can't find workers who want to work 40 hours a week. We will train them. And you're finding people who don't want to work. Now, what's the truth? The truth is probably more complicated than any one narrative. But the bottom line from my perspective is, if there are good opportunities for your business, you will raise wages, you will attract workers, and you will grow your company. And I'm looking for signs of that, and I'm not seeing it yet. Sorry, that's a long, meandering answer, but there's a lot underneath the question you asked. So Way Lutheran, in the back. Lutheran Social Service of Minnesota. Hi. Your Wikipedia page says you've, had, you've supported positions to cut Medicare. If that's true, that's a brave position. <laughs> Uh, everyone I'm reading about these days wants to cut Medicaid, about which we are deeply concerned. Uh, could you clarify? Yeah, first of all, don't believe what you read on Wikipedia, okay? <laughs> I, have, uh, I have never, uh, first of all, I've never edited my Wikipedia page, so God knows what's on there. Uh, second of all, I, that may be referring to an editorial that I wrote several years ago in the Washington Post, talking about how we need to have an honest conversation about entitlements. And the point is, you know, I talked about the demographics, the society's aging. Most of our entitlement programs are funded by current workers paying for current retirees. As that ratio changes, those programs become insolvent. And then we have to make some choices as a country. We either raise the retirement age, or we cut benefits, or we increase taxes. The solutions are those levers, and it really is just the politics of deciding which levers you want to pull. And so, the point that I was making was we are at some point going to need to make some tough choices about all of these programs, and we need to face that reality because that reality is coming. But thank you for asking. Hi, Pam Wadlock from Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity, and I'm just struck by your comment about one narrative and that the truth is complicated. So I just think about the region and understanding, not just in the Twin Cities, but across Minnesota, we are a location that welcomes and facilitates new immigrants and refugee populations. And we've had waves of them over the decades of, uh, from different parts of the world. And I'm just wondering how in your research you're thinking about looking at the experience of new immigrants, and most of our families, by the way, 85 to 90 percent, Kristen can answer that better than I, um, are, are really families of color and largely new immigrants. Um, but I'm wondering how you're looking at their experiences and comparing that to multi-generational poverty in, com in communities and families of color. Yeah, no, it's a very important factor and I, I don't have an answer yet other than I'm, I'm aware of what you're talking about. One of the, one contribution we might be able to make is getting access to data that university researchers don't get access to. Because we're the Federal Reserve, we have access and we have this neutrality that gives us the ability to maybe get access. And so actually yesterday I was having a conversation with our research director about that very topic, which is 
we might be able to, I'm not promising this, we might be able to get access to data on the Somali community as an example to understand their experience and how it differs from African American uh, communities experience that have been here for a very, very long time. You know, our board chair you mentioned is uh, Mai Kao Hong, who herself is a refugee and learning from her experience and the Hmong community and the experience there. So, I mean, this is an enormously complex topic and it's something that we're looking at, but we're only at the earliest stages of thinking about how do we begin to understand it. But you're right, I mean, the heterogeneity across these different communities may lead to very different experiences and very different policy responses that, th that they would need. Uh, my name is Susan Schneider. I'm with Plus Relocation. Uh, I, we're headquartered here. I'm the CEO of the company. I have about 200 employees. And you were talking about um, finding talent. And if I paid more for people, I'd be able to find the talent. And I just want to challenge that a little bit because, um, first of all, our tax rate here as a small business is really harsh on us. And it costs us a lot to have employees. I think some of the challenges we're faced with is our profitability is going down because of what it costs to have every employee. The amount of money I spend on cyber insurance now, the demands of companies here locally that put on for me to get business, I have to play as though I'm a 2,000 or you know 15,000. So, you know, we've got healthcare going up, we've got well-being benefits we've got to get. So I, I get concerned when if I just paid them more, I'd be able to find anybody I have because we have to be profitable too and we're a profit we do a profit sharing so we pay back to our companies or our employees but i think that the challenges we're getting tasked with around cyber and data security uh because of some of the things these big banks did or breaches in other areas it's hurting companies like mine because i mean my my tech budget now is over about equal to my payroll budget. And it used to be about half that. So how are we gonna support small businesses to stay afloat when we've got all these issues that have not much to do with me and maybe a lot to do with Russia? <laughs> I mean. So, uh, and uh -oh, by the way, Russia. I appreciate your comments. And I was, I was being flippant when I said, just pay them more. But from, from a national perspective, when I hear, or a regional perspective, when I travel around and I meet so many businesses who say, I can't find workers, and then I look at the national data and saying, wages aren't climbing very fast, that tells me it can't be that bad to find workers. Because if you really were having to compete with other companies to find this scarce talent, we would see wages climbing. And we're not seeing wages climbing very quickly. And so, that's the only reason why when I step back and look at this from a nation perspective and what does it mean for monetary policy, I'm looking for that wage growth as an indicator that, okay, maybe the economy is overheating, maybe now we're gonna start seeing inflation, maybe that's gonna lead us to need to raise interest rates. So that's why this is something that we think about a lot, but in no way do I mean to dismiss what you're experiencing as an individual challenges in your business. I know you're right, I know they're real, and I would also tell you that you, know, you mentioned tax rates, you mentioned other policy things, that other, other you know, your legislation, you know, the state legislature, federal legislat uh, legislatures have direct control over. I mean, we don't, but we are aware of these things and I know they're very serious. Last two questions. This is a good group, lots of questions, thank you. Hi. I'm yeah, Jill Riley, and I'm a, a retired school superintendent, and I'd just like to share with you a story that haunts me at night. Um, I first met Ricardo when he was in eighth grade. He barely could speak. I mean, he looked at the floor, and he was very quiet, and he um, went on to high school and was a D student, probably, to begin with, struggled, clawed his way through high school, got, graduated with about a B average, went on and wanted so desperately to go to college, he told me that over and over again. He left high school and enrolled in a community college. Um, he didn't have any money, so he couldn't start right away. He worked for a while, then he went back and took some courses, then he worked, and um, I, I've seen him struggling with that for six years. 
I bumped into him just very recently after six years being out of high school. He told me he had finished his associate degree that year, so it took him six years because he had to keep working all the time. And he wants, he's found that he is very talented with young children. He would be a great asset to Carolyn's programs or others. I know when I was working in at schools, I would have given a lot to have someone, a Hispanic male working with young children. And here he is now saying, well, I probably have to work for another year or two years to afford one semester of college. I, my question is, how do we find pathways for people who are qualified, who can move on to college, who want, it doesn't have to be school teacher or a BA, even technical training, how do we get them the pathways um, if they come out of school and they're fortunate enough to be prepared and desirous of that? Um, he has certainly tried hard and has not been able to really find that help, and I, I just feel badly that it's taken him six years just to get this far, and God knows how many more it will take for him to get to where he can do what he wants to do and what he loves. Well, I, look, there's no question that uh, one, of the one of the trends that's clear is that training and skill development is more important than ever, and it's only going to become more important going forward. So access to, it doesn't have to be a four-year college, but access to higher education is enormously important. And this is another one of those things where there are not necessarily easy answers. I mean, it's, it's, they're complicated solutions, everything from whether it's federal funding or state funding. Uh, we met yesterday with a, a, a company in the education space that's partnering with employers to say, here are the jobs that we need filled. Give us workers who have the skills we need where the employer actually pays for the training and then they bring workers in that way. There are also things using technology, online learning, et cetera. I think we need an all of the above strategy to try to create as many pathways as possible to reach as many young people as possible to give them the skills. I think many of those pathways can um, exist in beginning in high school. Absolutely. Where, where I met a young woman who went through her uh, certified nursing assistant program in high school. She, it wasn't that that's where she wanted to stop, but what she said was, it made me believe I could do it. And I think her goal now is to be a nurse anesthetist. If, again, funding may be an issue for her, but those pathways early in high school or giving them a start somewhere also helps a great deal, and it cuts costs in the future. Absolutely, and by the way, I would just also say, I know we're out of time, or almost out of time, is uh, we need to give our young people a lot more information when they're making their choices. Right? Too many young people take on huge student debt and then are angry, understandably, when they graduate and there are no jobs available. And if we arm people with data about, hey, these are, jobs are in demand, these are what these jobs pay, and people are able to make, I know the choices that I made, I mean, they worked out fine, but you know, when you're 17 years old and you're deciding what you're gonna major in or 18 years old, not a lot of real thought goes into it. And so if we can give people data to make smarter choices on the front end, I think that we'll also have happier people on the back end. Great, last question. Hi, my name is Leslie Holman. I'm a CEO entrepreneur of um, growing a small business. And I, um, my thoughts throughout today have gone back to the initial conversation about disparities and also taking action and what do we do. And I think the thing that worries me as a business owner sitting here is how am I contributing to the problem? And from that I mean, if I think about the women I've met in this room, I've seen so many wonderful, amazing female entrepreneurs starting businesses, pursuing their own careers. But then I think about the challenge of disparities. And as myself, as a woman who's growing a company, constantly looking for great talent, how, do, how is that trend in our economy of moving to more small businesses potentially contributing to the issue with disparities? And what I mean is, as we're closed off Minnesota people with our networks that we know, how do I break outside of that to create diversity in my own small business? How do I find those connections? I'm not a General Mills or an Ecolab with the budget to pursue diversity initiatives, but yet I'm a citizen in this community. I'm hugely passionate about fixing what's broken. And so that would be either a, a question or something to consider in your research is how has that trend and what our employment opportunities are available and how it's changed in even finding those opportunities. I've never posted a job. Every employee or contractor I've hired has been through word of mouth. And how do I break outside my own paradigm to help support the solution? Well, I mean, that's a great question and an important question. I would guess, I mean, I would ask you forums like this where you meet people from maybe outside of your immediate network maybe a way, but um, 
you all probably have better answers than, than I do, but I take, I'm glad you raised that point. And by the way, we're working very hard in our own in firm. We have 1,000 employees. We're working very hard in our own firm to improve our own diversity outcomes in our own firm because we have 1,000 employees in this region. We're a big employer, and we need to reflect the community that we serve. And so we have more work to do, and we're working on it too. Sure. Well, I just really want to thank you. Uh, what a rich conversation, interesting conversation. Very different to hear the, the focus of the Minneapolis Fed, and I applaud you in the work and the really interesting, creative approach into you know and how you're how you're engaging in work well beyond monetary policy. I think it's truly hugely important. Of course, as a banker, I wanted to ask when the next interest rate rises. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can that, ask. Yeah, yeah. He never answers anyway. <laughs> So just really want to thank you. For thank you very here. much. I appreciate it. Great conversation.